Every year, thousands of experts evaluate the status of animal, plant, algae, and fungi species around the world. Using a common language of assessment, they categorize each species' risk of extinction on the IUCN Red List. The Red List provides a barometer of life. And every year, the outlook gets worse. More than 31,000 species are currently threatened with extinction. Most because of human action. But human action can also reverse the Red List trend. So conservationists, governments, and communities around the world are joining forces, activating tried and tested IUCN tools in a coordinated effort to assess, plan, and act for wildlife. Together, we can save species from extinction. Together, we can win the fight for our planet's future. Together, we can reverse the red. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is John Paul Rodriguez. I chair the UCN Species Survival Commission. Welcome to these to this. Uh, series of five uh, training seminars on red list today we have a spectacular panel they'll be discussing national red listing and its links to the post 2020 global biodiversity framework as you know the international union for conservation of nature iucn has lots of tools which we call knowledge products today we'll be focusing on red list of species we just couldn't do everything in, in one hour but please uh, keep your eyes on the chat we will share links with the Red List of Ecosystems, key biodiversity areas, the global typology of ecosystems. And please, uh, if you have any questions, any additional information that you require, uh, either paste it on the chat or, uh, or send us an email after the, after this, the webinar. Um, I know that many of you are from all over the world, or most of you are from all over the world. So please uh, uh, join us by introducing yourself, saying where you're watching from, on the chat after this webinar, we will share both uh, the video and the chat with anybody interested. So uh, let's get going. I will start out by introducing our panelists and then we will uh, hear from them very briefly and open at the end. We have one hour, as I said, at the end we'll open with questions. Throughout this, the webinar, feel free to post questions uh, on the chat and our team will select them and send them to us or, or respond them uh, online if they can. So from Montreal in Canada, we have Jillian Campbell. She's the head of monitoring, review and reporting at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Welcome, Jillian. From South Africa, Domitila Raimondo. She's a threatened species program manager at the South African National Biodiversity Institute. You might have heard uh, of Sandy. Well, that's that institute. And Domitila will be the lead presenter. She's coordinating uh, these five webinars. Uh, from Brazil, Bla Braulio Diaz is at the Department of Ecology, the Institute of Biological Sciences, University of Brasilia. You may have heard from him because of his work with the Convention of Biological Diversity. We'll talk about that in a second. From Mozambique, Hermenegildo Matimele, He's chair of the National Red List Working Group of IUCN. He's at the Institute for Agricultural Research in Mozambique. And from China, Yang Biao, Secretary General of the Society of Enterprise in Ecology. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Julian Campbell for five minutes opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that was a powerful video. And as you pointed out, there really are people from all over the world. I'm watching the chat and it's it's quite impressive. Even someone from my hometown, St. Louis, I saw. So yeah, people from everywhere. Um, so I'm excited to be here today. And I think that this webinar is, is really timely for aligning the, the work on the Red List with the work on the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework as well. Um, as many of you know, parties, countries will be going to Nairobi to further negotiate 
the goals and targets of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework around this theme of living in harmony with nature. Um, this represents the commitment from countries to protect and conserve biodiversity for the next 30 years up until 2050 um, with a set of targets for the next 10 years approximately um, on how we will actually take action uh, towards, towards this theme of living in harmony with nature. Um, and after parties negotiate in Nairobi, then and this will be the next version of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which will move forward to the Conference of the Parties in Kunming, China later this year. Um, so just a, a little bit of thinking about where we've come from. So 30 years ago, the world adopted the Convention on Biological Diversity in Rio, Rio Brazil. This was a, a global realization of the fact that more action needed to be taken and that there was something that really needed to be done in order to, to change the trends on biodiversity loss. Um, and there was three objectives under the convention and there still are. This is the conservation, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, access to genetic resources and fair and equitable sharing of benefits of genetic and fair and equitable benefits from the utilization of genetic resources. Um, and in order to achieve these, these sort of three foundational elements of the convention requires action across all levels. Um, this is the same thing that I think is, is definitely recognized in this reversing the red initiative. Um, it can't be just isolated to actions by Ministry of, of Environment or by a few people working in conservation. It requires action across different sectors, across different groups and different communities and, and engaging with people at the global, national and local level to make this happen. Uh, in terms of the convention, this is a, a critical moment for the convention, as I said, because of the fact that we are looking to adopt um, something that will reduce biodiversity loss and protect natural capital for the future. If we look into the past, um, prior to now, we had a 10 year strategic plan called the Iachi framework and, and we only achieved six of the 20 global biodiversity targets that were set in that framework. And so in order to, to change this trend, there's important transitions that are needed in development patterns, policies and behavior. Um, it, it can't just be about conservation. We need to, to change the whole way that the world operates in order to reduce the indirect and direct drivers, which are creating biodiversity loss. So changing consumption patterns um, and, and changing pollution and, and changing how we actually interact with biodiversity and the impact people have on biodiversity. This framework has been evolving considerably over the last two years that we've been in a long negotiation period. So it's a little bit difficult to just share some of the key elements or aspects of this. Um, and, and different countries have different visions and ambitions and priority. However, it is clear that there's a commitment that, to trying to elaborate a framework that can be implemented on the ground in order to change the trend in terms of ecosystem and biodiversity lost. And the red list is currently recognized as a headline indicator associated with goal A of the draft global biodiversity framework. Goal A states that countries commit to um, protecting the integrity of all ecosystems uh, with an increase of at least 15% in the area of connectivity and integrity of natural ecosystems, supporting healthy and resilient populations of all species, and that the rate of extinction has been reduced at least tenfold with the rate of species extensions across all taxonomic and functional groups halved and genetic diversity of wild and domesticated species safeguarded with at least 90% of genetic diversity within all species maintained. It's quite a mouthful and, and that is still being negotiated, but um, that's the current draft of that goal. And as I said, as you can see, the red list is definitely related and integral to, to the idea behind this goal. Um, so one aspect of moving forward will be to, to revise national biodiversity plans, to work with countries and communities, to ensure that there's a whole of government and whole of society approach for implementing 
the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, we need ambition and we need action in order to avert this planetary crisis that we're facing where we have climate change, biodiversity and human health all intersecting. Um, this is also foundational, of course, to this Reverse the Red, which is the title of this webinar and this initiative. We all need to work together to ensure that there's coherence towards biodiversity action. It's important to keep in mind that we need everyone on board and biodiversity is in everyone's hands. I look forward to continue to collaborate with all of you towards the adoption of the framework and more importantly, to actually implement the framework to protect biodiversity. Thank you. Yes, thank you. After all, we're here to save species, not to negotiate <laughs> treaties alone. So Domitila, over to you. Uh, the, the, the main presentation, 15 minutes on the national red listing and its links to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a great pleasure to be presenting today to, to you all. And my talk is going to focus on the importance of national red listing and why do we have to make sure that we do red listing at the country level? Um, you've just heard from Gillian about the, the current state of the global biodiversity framework and its negotiations. And I'm going to show throughout this presentation how national red listing can support the goals and targets being suggested by the post in the, in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. I see many people from many different parts of the world and we're really hoping that some of you are also from um, countries and parties that have this responsibility to conserve biodiversity. Um, every actor is important, um, but we are very much looking at um, setting up the goals for, for countries to actually get going on red listing and if they're already doing it to, to expand how they use those national red lists. So I'm going to and start off just by making sure that we all understand what we mean by um, species red listing. We really promote the use of the IUCN 3.1 um, international standard for red listing. And when we do a red list assessment, um, we, we draw together really, really important information for each species. It's actually, you can think of it as a way of bringing the best knowledge of a species together. We draw from scientists, from uh, local communities, conservation practitioners from all stakeholders, we draw the information together to assess to assess each species. Um, here you see an example of a, of a frog that's been assessed from Mozambique. <clears throat> and it's, it's state, we, we, we assess the risk of extinction, so how likely a species is to go extinct, and the status that it gets is, is showing that. But there's, that's not all that a red list does. It also provides incredibly valuable information of where a species is. So if it's threatened, where does it still remain? And you can see in the map here, these two little orange spots of, of, of where the species is, is restricted to. And then as part of the assessment, we pull together all the information about how many individuals are left, where they are, but particularly important, what are the threatening processes to that species? And by actually outlining what the threats are, it helps us to identify the actions to save it. So the, the red list provides this foundational information that can help to lead to the actions to conserve species. Um, so to, in today's talk, we're going to talk about national red listing and, and what is national red listing? And essentially national red listing is, is, is assessments, red list assessments conducted for your country. Uh, we, uh, Everyone on this call is probably aware that we have the, the, the um, IUCN standard and, and, and knowledge um, information database on red listing called the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Um, the, it, within the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, each species that is included assesses the whole population of a species. And in these two examples that I'm showing in these two maps here, the one on the, on the left shows the um, what would be included in a global assessment, which is the entire range. If you look at this blue example, example A, the, the entire range of the species would be included in a global assessment. And for a national assessment, we only look at the proportion of the range occurring in the country. Um, but what is very important to note is that anything that's endemic to a country, so example E and D there, um, 
if those are assessed in a country and they haven't yet been included in the global red list, those are automatically global assessments and can be sent through to the IUCN and, and, and be part of the global assessment. So there's a strong linkage between global and national red listing, but it's just important to note that there is a slight difference in that when a country does assessments, they're only responsible for assessing the, popula the proportion of the population falling within their country. Okay, so what we really love is that all countries do multiple assessments for species across the broad range of taxonomic groups from invertebrates through to vertebrates uh, across the different environments, marine, freshwater and terrestrial. So a good national red list includes a wide array of species. Ideally, comprehensive assessments need to be conducted. So the whole taxonomic group. So if you're doing dragonflies, assess all dragonflies. And the reason being is that then you can tell what proportion of, of, of that group is threatened in your country. And that's important for monitoring data and also prioritizing. Uh, but the reality is many countries don't yet have the capacity to do all species. And for those countries, they're either resource constrained or capacity constrained, we really recommend focusing in on endemics and near endemic species. Okay, so the, the once assessments are done and you have a status for it, you, for a species, you can track that status over time. So if a species is assessed um, at one time period as vulnerable with extinction and in 10 years time you reassess it and its threats have got worse and it's critically endangered, that species risk of extinction has increased and that gets reflected on something called the red list index. And you can see in the graph on the left hand side how, we, how the red list index works. So you assess a whole group of species at two time points and you compare how the status of the species changes over time. And if species are becoming um, less threatened over time, the red list index line shown in green here will go up. If it's becoming, if they're all becoming more threatened over time, the line will go down. And it's a, the, the, shown in the red line here, um, with naught meaning all species are extinct and one meaning all, all species are least concerned. So if the, the red list index line is at the top, species are still pretty safe in your country. Um, if they're all at, the, at zero, you've got nothing left. So we, the Redis Index is, is, is a, a well-known indicator that's been used for at least the last 15 years. Um, and it's an indicator that's been proposed for the post-2020 framework. Um, you heard Gillian mention that we're in the process, countries are in the process of negotiating really difficult and important negotiations. Uh, what will be our targets for the next 10 years to conserve biodiversity? And this image here shows the theory of change. Um, that we are looking at putting in place tools and solutions to protect biodiversity that allow us to reduce threats while um, at the same time meeting people's needs. And there are 21 targets um, now being negotiated that, that um, will allow us, if we do this right, to, con to, to conserve biodiversity. And then out of that, there are four goals. And goal A has these three components. Um, maintaining ecosystems and preventing their collapse and then in red important for our discussion today is halting and reducing the risk of extinction of species and increasing the abundance of de depleted populations and then a third component on uh, maintaining genetic diversity and there's indicators that are required for these um, for, for, for these components of the goal, with the red list index being the, 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 the indicator required to measure the risk of extinction for species. So it's really crucial that each country actually has red list assessments and produces a red list index so they can report on how they're doing as part of the global biodiversity framework. Um, so it's not only goal A, there's also species components to many of the other targets. So there are 21 targets and national red listing, if it's done, will actually allow um, countries to get the information needed to support many of the targets. And I'll show these as I go on in my talk in a moment. Um, the IUCN is also developing a specific global species action plan, which is a new program of work um, that's going to show the actions required to, cons to, to help save species against all the, the targets of the global biodiversity framework. 
So it would be, it's important at this stage to look at, you know, why are we hosting this series of webinars that we're, we're, we're giving now? Why do we want to promote national red listing? And the reason is that we, it's not looking very good at the moment. Um, so if you, if you look at, at reports that countries write to the CBD, they have a responsibility, any country that signed the CBD, to report in national reports. The six national reports, which were the last reports out, um, showed that only six out of the 136 countries that reported have produced their own national red list index. So we're quite far from achieving what we are supposed to do. Um, however, many countries have got a national red list. So 54% of countries have produced national red lists, and the map on the left just shows where they are. But you, see, you can see very large gray areas where there are no national red lists and particular gaps in Southeast Asia and Africa. So lots of, of work required. So now the second half of my talk, I want to focus on, on why do it? Why is it important to spend a lot of effort producing species assessments at the national level? Um, and I'm going to link them each time to one of the targets of the, of the Convention on Biological Diversity. You can see below. Here, for example, I'm starting on target 20, which, which calls on countries to ensure that relevant knowledge is available to inform decision making. So when you do a red list assessment, you bring together all, all type, different types of stakeholders. You bring together um, cons uh, experts in the species, um, you bring together researchers, but you most importantly, you bring together conservation practitioners working in the field. You can draw on indigenous um, communities because their indigenous knowledge is also really important for red listing. So you bring all these stakeholders together and when you do an assessment, it's an incredible amount of knowledge that gets shared and it really sensitizes which species are important and need conservation action. Um, when assessments are done at the global level by a, a, a international experts um, uh, that resides far away from the country where the species occurs, that level of knowledge exchange doesn't happen. Whereas if it's done in the country, then the people who need to conserve it are there and can take action. Um, the other thing that is really good about producing assessments at the national level is you can organize experts um, and stakeholders into, into, into groups that are first used to produce assessments, but then thereafter can really help um, develop other policies to support decision making. So just here on the screen is, is from my own country showing that we have 10, 10 specialist groups that have been set up. Um, for freshwater, marine and terrestrial environment for all our different taxonomic groups. And then we bring them together, each, each one of them, um, are, we call them taxon leads, help um, to bring their, bring their specific information into the, um, our national biodiversity assessment processes. Um, the next benefit that I want to discuss is, the, is, is that when you do assessments, sorry, um, you you also find out the information required to protect that species. And it, and, it, and it leads to species action plans and recovery action recovery plans being generated in, in countries. Um, here's an example from, from our country um, where we have legislated the development of biodiversity action and biodiversity management plans for species. And these, these action plans lay out all the actions required to conserve a species. This again links to a new target under the Global Biodiversity Framework that calls for active management plans to enable the recovery and conservation of species. So really, really important that the Red List supports the, the, the direct information needed there. Here's an example of, of the Cape Mountain zebra, which was a citizen is endangered. And because of the biodiversity management plan that's been developed for the species and actions that have been put in place um, over the last 10 years, the species has now dropped to least concern and it even led to a downlisting of, uh, of its, um, its CITES, CITES appendix listing from appendix one to two. Um, Probably the most oppressive examples of, of action plans come from Brazil because Brazil has legislated that for every species that's nationally listed as threatened, there needs to be a, a, an action plan for that species. Um, and so they've got um, 70 species action plans that cover 1,200 species of fauna and flora. Um, Brazil's also produced an amazing wealth of legislation to 
following on from the national red list processes. Um, they've undergone detailed assessments of plants and animals over the last 10 years um, and brought together many, many experts. And now they've developed a national strategy for the conservation of threatened species that's been legislated and it guides the implementation um, of, of these action plans that I've mentioned, but also very importantly, it guides the expansion of protected areas. The other, the other critical um, benefit that comes from national red listing is it provides spatial information for each species. As I said right in my introduction slide, we, we have detailed maps of where each species occurs um, called area of occupancy maps. And these can be used to feed into where you spatially prioritize land for uh, for biodiversity. So where you say this area may not be developed because we need to protect it for biodiversity. So the map on the left shows in my country, South Africa, the bright green areas are areas that we want to retain for biodiversity called critical biodiversity areas. The dark green are protected areas and the, the, the um, light green are ecological support areas. So the, the, our species, our threatened species information, you can see over 5,000 threatened and range restricted species have gone into the spatial biodiversity plan in South Africa. These, this information says, okay, where we've got a special threatened species, it's an area that may not be developed. Um, and this feeds into the new target one of the global biodiversity framework, which for the first time is calling for integra integrated and biodiversity inclusive spatial planning. So this, if you do a national red list, you'll produce the spatial information that can help spatial plans. And then taking that down another level to the actual site base, um, your, your national red lists provide the spatial information to show the exact sites that you should be conserving. And target three of the global biodiversity framework is calling that we protect, I'm sure you've all heard about 30 by 30, we're trying to protect 30% of the planet by 2030, but where we need to protect is particularly important. And there's this clause, especially areas of importance for biodiversity. And our national red list data um, that identifies the places where special species occur, threatened and restricted range species, are where we need to expand protected areas. And here's an example from Mozambique um, in their recent um, identification of key biodiversity areas. So Mozambique, over the last four years, has produced a first time a national red list. It's covered many plants, um, invertebrates and, and, and endemic um, um, vertebrates such as reptiles and, and freshwater fish that weren't assessed before. Um, and through this generation of data, we've identified, uh, um, Mozambique's identified 29 key biodiversity areas that are now um, being prioritized for protected area expansion. So just to conclude, the National Red Lists provide an incredibly important knowledge base of which species need to be protected in a country. They provide the data to monitor the trends of species via the Red List Index. But most importantly, they, they, they guide the development of policies to protect species as well as inform where protected areas need to expand to. And I'm going to stop there and hand back to John Paul, so we'll give the other panelists a chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Domitilla. There are many, many questions that have come up in the chat, and I will try to summarize and select a few for the Q&A. But one quick question, which are the six countries that have red list indices? Oh, if you okay. remember. Okay, <laughs> yes. just, just look Sweden, for that. Look for Sweden, that. Sweden, Denmark, um, Netherlands, South Africa. Who are the other ones? Uh, yeah, okay. those are the, off the top, top of my head. They're mostly Scandinavian countries. Okay, great. Well, if you if you have the list, just type it on the on the chat so people uh, can okay. look. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Dr. Yang Biao, we we have we know very much about your work with uh, Chinese red lists and how they support you to monitor populations of threatened species and how they're used uh, to identify new protected areas. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about about that story? Over to you. Okay. Thank you. Let me introduce my some of my work. As a one of the 70 mega biodiversity countries in, in the world, China harbors nearly 10 percentage of all plants, species, and 14 percentage of animal on Earth. However, in the past decades, the rapid development of the country have put great pressure 
on biodiversity and their habitats. Some species have become exist, exist, extinct before they are known to human, which is great loss, not just to species, but as well to the ecosystem or even human ourselves. So in order to protect uh, Sweden the species and uh, reverse the trends of the losing biodiversity, the Chinese government have evaluated the biodiversity conservation to a national strategy and release a series of national red list, include the China Red Date Book of Plants, China Red Date Book of Endangered Animals, China Special Red List, China Red List of Biodiversity, uh, in order to top down conservation actions led by the government, several bottom up conservation actions have been initiated by NGOs like C Foundation. C, C Foundation, it's my foundation, works close with the Endangered Species Scientific Commission, the PRC, identify a list of wild animals and plants in urgent need of um, higher conservation in China and uh, constructed priority index PI to assess the conservation priority of species in China in terms of extinction risk, relics, and other aspects. In totally 476 species of non-marine animals, 1,367 species of, of birds, 156 species of genomic bird, and 8,000 800 species of monocolidus were included. C Foundation also worked close with the International Commission since 2018, uh, collaboration with IUCN and the Chinese Academy of Science to update IUCN Red List uh, assessment for about 3,000 Chinese reptile, amphibian, and uh, freshwater fishes, and to help understand their uh, straighten the states and guide conservation efforts lead. China national red list are the baseline and or better to see a critical for helping identify the new protected area and improve the current uh, protected area management. Uh, also have uh, its rela related management policies to stress and improve the management system of protecting Chinese national red list species such as uh, build a protect area system uh, centering with uh, national parks and uh, the central government have just released the first five national parks in the last October to protect the flagship such as panda, such as jet panda, northeast tiger, armor, leopard. And the second is released the economic red light system, which is to critical great real to local development, they have to offer, obey their policy and keep the keep and reserve the key uh, habitat for red list species and important habitats. So by integrating the scientific evidence into conservation planning by use of method like key biodiversity area, C Foundation was able to update this its conservation strategies identity priority area since 2008, C Foundation provided over 1.12 uh, million yuan to over 800 NGOs, research institutions, conser conserving over 51,000 square kilometers of land, air, and water. Land and water. Most of the area are important habitats for the three species identified by the using red list criteria or real. Area beyond the existing part area or important ecological corridor. Yeah. I'm done. Yes, thank you so much. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks. That was great. Very interesting work. Now I'll go over to Emmanuel uh, Hildo Matimele. Uh, could you please? I mean, the, one of the big challenges in a country like Mozambique is that there's a uh, very low capacity and, and low data availability, but yet over the last five years, you've been able to publish assessments for national endemics. And uh, tell us about that and what difference it has made to identifying KBAs, key biodiversity areas for the country. Over to you. 
Thank you for, and it's a really great pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar today to share the experience from Mozambique. Of course, Mo Mozambique, um, it's true that uh, it's a, um, a developing country. Uh, for those who may not know where Mozambique is, it's a country in Southern Africa with an area of um, um, over 800,000 square kilometer. Um, and it's of course, uh, very rich in terms of uh, its biodiversity um, due to biological diversity, which derives from the, the country's diverse geography, geology, and climate, including the fact that uh, um, our Indian Asian course is very long, about 3,000 kilometers long. But despite all this um, obvious biodiversity rich country, Mozambique has received only limited and party survey coverage um, over the many years. So just to give you um, an overview or a background on this, there are many reasons behind that. Uh, one of them is that uh, um, since Mozambique became independent in 1975, the country was engaged in a 16 year civil war up to the signing of peace agreement, which was in 1992 which followed, was followed by many years of widespread landmine clearance, and that delayed field surveys until the mid 2000s. So since that time, uh, by the end of the civil war, Mozambique as a country committed itself to a number of the national conventions. Uh, just to give you some examples, uh, the Bamako Convention um, on the protection of the ozone layer, which signed in 1993, just one year after the war, and uh, Mozambique joined the CBD um, two years after the Civil War, which was in 1994. And later, um, also Mozambique ratified its supplementary agreement, uh, which is the Nagoya Protocol in 2004. So these were key steps that um, government and uh, um, Mozambique as a country took as far to show its commitment uh, with respect to biodiversity. So through this, uh, it allowed um, the country to engage uh, on a number of initiatives at the regional level and international level with the aim of building capacity and mobilize uh, biodiversity data, working closely with the key institutions, including herbarium, museum, uh, research institute, academia, etc. So through this collaboration, Mozambique learned that uh, actually the ICN release of species uh, and its system now it's an initiative that allows determining the level of threat that species and ecosystems are subject to. For that reason, it is an important tool which helps understanding uh, the state of biodiversity, allowing authorities to direct conservation efforts to species and ecosystems that are priority. Therefore, it was in 2009 when a group of uh, Mozambican botanists, they joined the Southern African Plant Specialist Group under the Species Survival Commission um, of the ICN. So that was a, a kickstart of the red listing process uh, that never stopped and it continued and it's conducted uh, with some degree of regularity in Mozambique. So Mozambique works closely with institutions that hold history, uh, long history on mobilizing funds, conducting field surveys and conduct red leasing. Uh, for example, Sambi has been a key player on that, uh, that process. Kew Gardens has helped a lot. Uh, DICE have been helping a lot on how to use that data into spatial planning, et cetera. So, and because the, uh, uh, the plant uh, uh, experts in Mozambique have been conducting uh, road leasing assessments on a regular basis, um, it was then um, in, in, in 2019, um, under the, the, the key biodiversity areas project uh, supported by led by WCLS, that Mozambique uh, as a country organized themselves uh, to include people working on plants, but also people working on farm to conduct um, a, a bigger red listing training that was uh, a really uh, a success. Through that training, um, many young uh, biologists uh, got to learn how to assess species, um, including amphibians, freshwater fish, insects, and reptiles that had never been uh, assessed before. So building from uh, the work that the plant group was uh, conducting in the country, 
and then we engaged with uh, with fauna expert as well. So our strategy has been to first define the priorities. So we had to define where do we have to focus in terms of data mobilization in the country. So we have been focusing on the mountains, coastal dry forests, central endemism. So those areas that had never benefited from uh, a field or data gathering in, in the field. With that information, we then conducted red listing for endemic species, near endemic species, and ranger species. So why did we choose those groups? Well, it's known that endemic species are an important component of a country's biodiversity stewardship and natural capital. So narrowly restricted endemics are often amongst the species most sensitive to environmental change and disturbance, and so at highest risk of extinction. So for that reason, it's key, it's unaddressed possibility of each country to make sure that those species don't go extinct. So these species therefore inform important component for a range of methods uh, for identifying and conserving biodiversity priority, including initiatives such as important plant areas, key biodiversity areas. So those tools can only be implemented effectively when you have done the red leasing assessment and you know exactly where those species are. So uh, we asked also what difference this has made to identify the key biodiversity area. As I explained, uh, in fact, this process of uh, identifying IPAs and KBAs are vital steps for biodiversity conservation because they are the means of providing baseline information on biodiversity and its distribution within a particular geographical area. So building on the extensive work on the ice and red lease uh, of treating the species, Mozambique was able to apply the IPA criteria and the KBA criteria uh, throughout the country, so to be able to map where those biodiversity priority areas are, are found. And because the KBA and the IPA are based on criteria that require species information, including, for example, to identify KBAs, you need to know uh, what species are treated, uh, what species are range restricted, and so on. So conducting red lists, it helps you to narrow down uh, that information and be able to apply the, 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 the criteria. So for the KBA process, for example, we had information mostly for criteria A and criteria B, uh, which is uh, which focus on treatment by diversity and geographically uh, restricted by diversity. So that was possible because we had conducted the, 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 the red list. But most importantly, that I'd like to emphasize here is with red listing is that we are confident on the quality of information we have used to define areas of biodiversity importance for Mozambique. It's extremely important to make sure that the information taxonomy um, and the distribution of the species is accurate because if you miss um, identify the species and you misplace them where they are found on the landscape, uh, the whole um, national priority um, uh, system is, 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 is not going to be um, an effective tool. It's not going to help achieve the goals that um, a country may have committed to. So how do all these initiatives are contributing to uh, policy legislation and reg uh, regulation in the country? Well, uh, red list species uh, are now being included in a number of regulations, including, for example, the sea fishing regulation, which was uh, the species, marine species, were included in, in 2020, uh, resulting from uh, the, the work we've been doing. And also the regulation for bird species, which covers treated and near treated species uh, with their habitat. So Mozambique has produced a list of species that need to be uh, taken into consideration. Recently, which was uh, on the 19th May 2020, uh, there was a, a ministerial diploma for biodiversity offsets in Mozambique. Uh, which includes treating the species, um, which considers treating the species as elements of biodiversity for avoidance. And it also includes the key biodiversity areas as areas of avoidance. But if their impact on those areas, then net gain must be achieved. And net gain has been defined as 15% uh, uh, above the threshold without um, uh, net loss. So, they are also the KBS, they are also regarded as offset recipient in Mozambique. So all these, um, all these tools are being developed in response to all activities that have been implemented as a result of red listing species, 
conducting um, identifications of important plant areas and key biodiversity areas. So um, those um, um, uh, area-based uh, priority areas are being developed, are being included also in uh, national territorial development plan, um, both on land as well um, as in the city. So, of course, although we have done this, we have defined our priorities focusing on uh, marginally studied areas, focusing on endemic regulatory to the species, do assessments, identify priority areas for those species. There's still a huge gap, there's still a lot to do, uh, particularly with respect to uh, regulation. So we still don't have a, a proper regulation for amphibians, marmots, reptiles, freshwater fish, but that's an ongoing work. And as you may have seen uh, from uh, Domitila's presentation uh, with re respect to Mozambique, so you could see that her number of uh, key biodiversity areas, for example, they had a lot of plant species. This is because the Mozambican plant group um, has a long history of working on red leasing uh, plants, and therefore it has helped other taxonomic groups within the country to also initiate uh, this process. I think this uh, is what I would like to share with you for now, and um, I'm happy to add more or as we go. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Menhido. Very impressive work. Congratulations for both of you, Yang Liao and, and Menhido. Now we'll go over to to Braulio Diaz, um, they have two questions for you. The first one is, you know, could you please describe the value of Brazil's national red listing work, especially, and how this has led to the development of policies to protect species? Thank you, John Paul. Uh, good morning to all. So uh, for us, uh, national red listing is uh, essential because only by conducting national red listing, uh, we can link that with public policies and provide legal protection to threatened species. Uh, Brazil has a long history of uh, uh, conducting uh, national red listing. Our first list was issued in 1968. And since then we have been issuing uh, uh, continuous uh, updates the national, uh, the latest list uh, included all species of vertebrates. That means more than 9,000 species in Brazil, plus a number of uh, uh, groups of invertebrates and a number of groups of plants. And uh, uh, the way we work with uh, uh, the red list, and, and sorry, uh, also many uh, states in Brazil have uh, uh, issued their uh, subnational red list. So a third of Brazilian states have done that. Um, to conduct uh, this work, we uh, um, use several um, uh, policy tools. So a first one is uh, the information about the species that occur in Brazil. So we have been uh, updating uh, regularly the national list of plants and animals in Brazil. And uh, another um, uh, tool has been the identification, uh, the, uh, of course, the establishment and management of protected areas. And uh, uh, we have more, uh, some 2,600 protected areas in Brazil and covering more than 18% of the continental area and more than 26% of marine areas. And uh, plus indigenous lands and um, also uh, uh, environmental requirements of our forest code. So uh, we, we uh, utilize uh, these legal uh, protections and then we conduct a gap analysis to see, uh, to check uh, 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 to what extent uh, uh, species that are in our red list are being covered by existing protected areas. Uh, and if not, that is um, uh, an indication for proposals for new protected areas. So uh, uh, also we have been uh, utilizing uh, these uh, uh, gap analysis to identify uh, what we call gap species. So species that currently are not receiving conservation attention. 
So a major tool we have been utilizing is the development and implementation of national action plans. So as Domitila mentioned, we have more than uh, 70 of these national action plans that include, uh, most of them include several uh, species of uh, similar taxonomic groups or from uh, a same region, uh, covering more than uh, uh, 1,200 species, threatened species. Also, we have a new approach established in the last two, three years, which are territorial uh, action plans. So we have uh, now uh, uh, additional plans uh, and these are being operated through environmental agencies in Brazilian states. Um, also, we utilize uh, uh, ecosystem monitoring data. So since the mid 1980s, Brazil conducts regularly uh, remote sensing uh, on the status and degradation of ecosystems using remote, uh, uh, remote data, remote sensing, so satellite data mostly. And um, so by bringing all these tools together, uh, we have been uh, managing to enhance our conservation efforts. And of course, the action plans include uh, a, a large number of partners for their implementation, including public and private uh, organizations, civil society organization, academic organizations, uh, uh, private sector organizations. So this uh, uh, spread the burden of uh, uh, implementing these uh, action plans. And uh, I think it's uh, critical that each country um, uh, produce their national uh, red list uh, so they can provide legal uh, protection to the threatened species. And in Brazil, we benefit uh, from the fact that our national constitution uh, mandates uh, the conservation of threatened species. So uh, uh, we have established several instruments to do that in, in 2014 we consolidated that by uh, establishing a national uh, threatened species conservation program. And uh, later in 2018, we established a national strategy for threatened species. So uh, this uh, all helps to uh, enhance conservation of species. And of course, by having these legal uh, protection, it means that uh, people cannot hunt, fish, uh, or extract uh, animal and uh, uh, plant species. Uh, so we utilize this uh, red listing in a number of legal cases to confront those people that are conducting illegal uh, uh, actions and threatening species. I was going to ask you just a quick question as, as, a, as a former executive secretary of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, but I think you've answered the question, which is you're, you encourage countries strongly to pursue the national red lists uh, as they would help them uh, monitor the progress on the global biodiversity framework. Exactly. Uh, having the global assessments conducted by IUCN is a good resource, but by itself, it doesn't provide legal protection to the species. So we need uh, action at national level to provide the legal protection of species. And by conducting national red listing, uh, uh, that's a way to uh, provide such a legal uh, protection, but it also is a way to engage the national community of experts of our institutions, uh, our organizations in the academy, in civil society, in the business community, etc. And uh, the Brazilian legal framework uh, uh, relies a lot on uh, our red list uh, to uh, challenge uh, uh, organizations that uh, are threatening uh, our uh, uh, our species. So. I would, uh, as you said, uh, John, 
uh, uh, I would like to uh, encourage very much each country to uh, establish their own national uh, red list system. Of course, um, this can be challenging for countries that are data poor and that don't have much, uh, many experts, but you can do that in a stepwise process. You can start, for example, uh, by recognizing the uh, species, uh, threatened species recognized by IUCN lists in a national legislation uh, uh, to provide legal uh, protection. And you can start work uh, like in Mozambique with uh, endemic species. So it can be a stepwise process and uh, this can be improved uh, year by year. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have about five minutes left. Uh, there are many, many questions on the chat from the from the audience. Thank you so much for your feedback. This uh, webinar will be the recording will be posted online and the chat will be posted online as well. So you can see many of the answers have been already uh, provided. But there are a couple of things, Domitila, I think mainly aimed at you uh, that have to do with technical aspects of national red listing using uh, you know an API interface with the global red list. If there's any space in the global red list for national assessments, how do you connect? national and global uh, lists. There are lots of comments that are around those themes. So maybe a few words before we close. Thank you, John Paul. I think the, the most important thing is to, to note that, that these technical questions um, will be answered in the subsequent webinars that will be, um, that are upcoming. I'm just gonna share them again on the screen and we'll post them in the chat, but they are, um, we're going to have a specific session on how to conduct national red list assessments, what are the criteria to do it, how do you do it, um, a step-by-step -step guidance on setting up a national red list project. So similar to what Braulio has just been saying to you, like what are the what are the steps that you do, what are the first step, second step, how to go about it depending on your level of, of resources and capacity in the country. Um, and then how to do this National Red List Index. Uh, I outlined that we only had six countries who, who reported National Red Lists in their, in their six national reports. So we definitely are doing a training on, on how to produce a National Red List Index. I saw quite a few technical questions on what do you use to, to, to measure change in status. So that will be covered in the, in the webinar in, this, in September. And then lastly, um, you know, we want to show that we actually have a website for um, for, for national red lists and um, we also are uh, have a team available to support national red listing and and so our last web um, webinar on the 19th October will will cover just how do you manage to do your national red listing on, on which information system and how do you share your data if you have done a national red list so so please just encourage all of those of you who have the responsibility to work on national red listing to to attend these these follow-up um, webinars Thank you so much, Domitila. So we just have like one minute left. I have to say that for me personally, this is a wonderful seminar series, webinar series, because National Red Lists are the reason why I became involved uh, with IUCN. And um, it's really great to see so much progress uh, taking place all over the world. I would like to thank uh, the panel for a wonderful discussion, great examples. It uh, fills us with hope that you know all of these things are possible with very different institutional frameworks and resources. And thank you to the audience. I mean, you guys have been very interested and active. There are four more webinars where many of those questions will be answered. Please always reach out if you have additional questions and please keep up working on reversing the red. There's a lot more work that still needs to be done. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you, especially to the panelists, but we reached about 300 participants at some point, which is really fantastic. And hopefully uh, this, these numbers will continue growing and will continue spreading the desire to produce national red lists all over the world. So thank you all and uh, see you in a few weeks on the next one. Bye-bye.